uh, the observer would say from a financial standpoint, if you can maintain the current level of buys for the tape shows, then the way everything is restructured, they could save a lot of the hundred thousand dollars per week in fixed costs, much of which are expenses for the live shoot. And they'll be close to break even. So as best you can recall in February and March, is that really the strategy rather than we're trying to dig out as much profit? We're just trying to get to even, is that the way you remember it? So I guess now's as good a time as ever. So where was that quote from the hundred thousand dollar? The observer. Okay. Did you recently say, um, as a matter of fact, I did. And I tagged you in it where, and boy, I hate to, you did. Okay. I did. I did because Dave Meltzer came out and pretty straight up said that TNA had lost $55 million (laughs) when, as he said, Bob, Bob Carter tried to sell to Toby, Toby Keith. Well, you've sort of laid out here on the show. You had to become very familiar with the numbers because it was actually you who was trying to convince Toby to buy out Bob. So Toby was trying to make a pitch to buy from Bob, not Bob trying to make a pitch to Toby to sell, but as you're trying to gather all of your due diligence, I guess is what we would call it. Anytime you're doing a deal like this. Well, that means you're going to have a look at a lot of audited financials and whatnot. And a savvy business guy like Toby Keith, I know you think he's the red solo cup guy, but my man was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Million dollar. So, so he knew how to do business. And that would have meant if I'm going to buy your business, I kind of need to know where the numbers are. So you were familiar with that. And for, for Dave to come out and say that TNA had lost $55 million. I thought to myself, self, I got to ask Jeff Jared about that. Cause I don't think that's the way Jeff has explained it on the show before. So I'll give you the, the napkin math, but, but my point was when I read the notes, Dave himself reported that the weekly nut was a hundred K, right? Yeah. Why would Dave fabricate 58, 55? There, that number is so ridiculous. And as my attorney uh, who's a wrestling fan and, and others have said, don't call them journalists, call them critics. It, 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 it just, it, it clears up all the air, but why, why do you think Dave would come up with that number knowing it's, it's, it's completely fabricated by his somewhat his own reporting. Why do you think Conrad? And I'll give it napkin math here in a second. I'm not sure. I mean, I really don't know. I don't either. I mean, I really don't know. It, It is, I don't know. It, it, it was a head scratcher because I'm like, he's really got a hard on for TNA and he's had a hard on for Jeff Jarrett. And I don't, look, hard on for me is a talent. Do it all the day. That's, look, you hated me back in the day. Everybody hated you. Everybody listening to this hated your stinking guts. <laughs> It means you were good at your job. It doesn't mean you were bad at business. But, but he he reported, and then I think he reported on top of that that I told him twenty eight million. Yeah. So listen, I don't want to quote Dave wrong. I've gotten myself sideways with Dave before when because he doesn't listen to the show, but yes. somebody inevitably is going to tell him, "Oh, Conrad said." Yeah. Well, let's get it right here. I actually sent the tweets over to Marcus. Even if you don't see him here, Jeff Marcus Lattleman post. But he says TNA lost 55 million up to the point Bob Carter tried to sell to Toby Keith. So you're incorrect there as well. And I actually quote tweeted that. And that's when I piped in and said, Hey, I got to ask Jeff about this. Well, someone responded and it was a quote from you where you said the narrative that TNA never made money. It is baffling, but Hey man, if you don't get out there in front of things, it's very obvious, but the real easy and I'll go as granular as you want. But when we got the spike deal, we became profitable that day. We'll say that week. Now the investment that went in, we made it back. But when you go from one to two hours and you don't double your expenses. So 07, 08, 09, 09 was the most profitable year by far. I received those owner checks and the talent was, you know, Kurt Angle was making great money. There was a lot of guys making really good money. Okay. Profit. And that's paying the bills and paying investors back and all those kind of things back eight to 10 million 
it's kind of crazy to think that all of our investment, and I don't know, I don't want to get into hypotheticals and all that, but the Carter's investment just wasn't as rich as people seem to think because the asylum, and I've gotten into the asylum days, that's about a hundred grand a week. That's what we were spending. So we were making some money. We didn't go in that proverbial deep, dark hole that people, I guess, believe. I don't know. It goes without saying that when we got the spike deal, we became profitable that day. Now, Meltzer quote tweeted that on March the 1st. So as you and I are recording this just three days ago, and he said, Jeff told me losses were $28 million. Toby Keith, when he was looking at buying it, said it was 55 million. Jeff disputed that number. So boy, a lot to unpack here. Okay. So let's go into just expenses and you're okay. good at math. June till uh, September of year one, right? That's hell South money. Okay. They pulled it at the very least, we came out a little bit ahead. They called and said, not only can we not fund uh, tonight's show, we can't fund last week's. Well, once they kind of understood the, the reading of the tea leaves, we got money. So let's just call the first three or four months a complete wash because you also have to put Jerry and Jeff Jarrett's investment in there, startup and all that kind of stuff. But if we, if we start in September and go to the next September at 100K a week, that's, I'll let you do the math, Conrad. 100K a week, that's 5.2, right? Yep, yep. Okay, and then we're going to go another year at another 5.2. That's 10.4. Okay, and then we're going to go another year. So three years, that gets us. 15.6. Oh, yeah, okay. That's with not creating a penny of revenue. Right. Let's add a little bit more in there on um the fox sports net because we paid a little bit and then there's a couple of instances as this is how our conversation got started today we did a couple of tape shows which would pull out the 100k anyway and i'm saying if no revenue came in we never got past at, look 15 16 17 18 that's the quick with zero revenue which we know that's not the case we we were creating revenue so the twenty-eight million that 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 Dave is claiming is really not accurate because here's where that number, the highest number, because it was asked when I had to do the due diligence, that the number ever got was twenty-eight million, but that includes interest. It's it's when Panda, and this is all a tax and a big. I see. So Panda was loaning the money here and then charging interest to recoup interest yes but but the reality is that's big buddy you know big corporate money tax situation uh the, the, it makes things hey you know if you want to squeeze your investor which that they were owners of their investment it's a little bit different but they were playing the bank and they did interest one company was loaning another company money and they didn't do it out of the kindness of their freaking heart because they had shareholders over there so they had to explain Hey, uh, we're getting a return on this. And it sounds like eventually they did. Bingo. Yes. Which, which is crazy though, that Dave has such, he doesn't, he, I, I don't think it looks good on him these days. And I, and I have no idea. That's the question. Why does he have such a hard on and would completely fabricate 55 million and, and in the same vein that. Bob's trying to sell to Toby. Well, it almost reads like he's saying that, that Toby perhaps told him 55 million. I'll be honest. I didn't know Dwayne Johnson called Dave Meltzer until this year. Like the idea that the biggest movie, one of the biggest movie stars of all time has Dave Meltzer on speed dial blew my freaking mind this year. Wow. But, but I'm saying all that to ask, did Toby Keith talk to Dave Meltzer? Shit, no. I mean, that just doesn't. It's like, wait, how in the world is Dave Meltzer talking to country stars? Like, and he, I get how he's talking to Dwayne, but Dwayne's in the rest of them. And I don't know this. Yes. Or, anyway, he, all this. He, he, here's where it got even to me when you really extrapolate the out the entire story. Toby had the opportunity to get in this wrestling business. And this is why I still get, I'll never have a friend like Toby. Well, who knows? I'm, I'm getting 
a little bit too dramatic, but the type of friend Toby was, he had multiple opportunities to get into the wrestling business without Jeff. They tried their ass off. <laughs> and as they more specifically Janice than, than, you know, than, than Bob, because I, I think Bob knew the real deal. I think me and Bob uh, always had a, 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 fabulous relationship in spite of what people may perceive, but, and he kind of knew or he found out real quick, look, Toby doesn't want to get in the wrestling business without Jeff. And he's kind of made that clear up front. And then they tried again and they tried again. And then they tried in November of 2013. And that was, Hey dude, it ain't going nowhere. When you decide what your next steps are, uh, let me know. And then there goes global force and then trying to get the TV deal. That's the other podcast, but it's, it's, it's bizarre. But if you look at Dave as a critic, as opposed to a journalist, it clears up a lot of things. He's a critic and he likes to criticize TNA and Jeff Jarrett. Unfortunately. Well, he would also write in this era that there were a lot of negative feelings uh, and that was just the general overall feeling backstage because they feel like there's declining interest. And I guess maybe some of the boys are upset that we're going to be doing tape shows. And maybe that means less money for them. It's a startup. We're trying to run a business, but you sort of took issue with the idea that, you know, going to a tape show might save you some of that hundred grand a week. It almost acted like you weren't sure that it really did cost a hundred grand a week, but. Dave actually recently quoted you saying it was a hundred grand a week. So was it roughly a hundred grand a week? I mean, that's even the quick and dirty math that we talked about. It and is. How much was that affected with the tape show? So we, okay. So this is, uh, I want to make sure I kind of stay on the timeline and I may get these months off, but there came a time when the Carters, like any good investor is and said, Hey, is there any way that, that during this growth and they understood investment, is there any way we can maybe tighten the purse strings uh, and get more economical and not drop revenues? Because if we can save a little bit more, that means we're making a little bit more. Yes. And that was where, yeah, Bob, we can. We can go to three live and one tape uh, on, on a month schedule. And we believe the tape show will drop some, but will it drop enough that it makes us lose more money? And we were all willing to make that gamble. And as time kind of moved along, that's when me and my dad uh, went out and found another investor who was willing to take over everything, cash flow. Uh, I mean, he was ready to, to dive right in. And the Carter said, nope. And so we never really went into this tape deal. But this was the era that basically our investors said, Hey, let's think about all options. And that was our first one. And knowing that, um, again, startup mode, but heck, it goes without saying. Um, our, our young core of talent, James Storm, Chris Harris, AJ Styles, uh, I'll, I'll leave many, many out, but you know who I'm talking about, the core guys that we wanted to for them to give us our all. Again, it's a Wednesday night, so it wasn't a weekend booking. We wanted to give it at all, but we knew that would be going from four to three which is 25%. It's a big ass deal, but we were small business owners as my partner like to say that we were trying to figure out how's this thing uh, going to keep on trucking and grow because we knew we were getting bites at the apple in our international uh, set of circumstances and, and, and some small licensing. And, and again, it's, it's, it's so hard. I think for today's listener, that if you really weren't around in this on a day-to-day pre-social media coming off the attitude era, those two factors, hindsight's 2020. But when I look back on 2002, 2003, 2004, what a, just the landscape of, of professional wrestling was massively different. I mean, YouTube was it. When, when did YouTube launch about the oh, oh six, I think. Okay, so pre YouTube, yeah, yeah, it's just a completely different era. You really just had the internet and and websites. You you didn't have any. It was February. It was Valentine's Day of five. I'm sorry. 
of YouTube. Okay, but that's when you launched, everybody was still nobody. That did it didn't catch on. I mean, it no, was nobody knew what it was or yeah. No, no, no. So anyway, a completely different landscape. So when you kind of look back during this era, um it's fascinating. Uh, a lot of fun. I learned a lot of lessons. I'll tell you that much. But uh, old Unky D did uh, had his math wrong, and he's doubled down on it with the silly tweets. But oh well, 